Hello, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. We're so glad that you've tuned in to join us for our online recorded worship. We are looking forward to worshiping with you uh, in these uh, coming uh, moments, and, and we are glad that uh, you're a part of this time together with us. We're in the chapel at St. Peter and St. Paul, and uh, Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer are here with me. They put together our videos every week, and we are very grateful to them for their time and effort and energy. And we are grateful that you ha are taking the time to worship with us. We, we trust and we pray that God will be with us as we worship together on this third Sunday of Lent, and we continue our Lenten journey, and we ask for God's peace and blessings. We also want to invite you to join us for our in-person worship at St. Peter and St. Paul. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. here at our church at 3001 Queen City Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45238. We would love to have you. Please join us, and uh, we will look forward to worshiping with you in person. And now may God bless us as we prepare our spirits for the worship of God. Please join me for our responsive call to worship. God of sea and sky, you keep the earth flourishing. We come before you, weary from traveling through barren lands. Holy One, you give water that sustains body and spirit. You hydrate us when we need, how we need. Miracle worker, you caused a rock to crack and bring forth water. Crack our hearts open and let your love flow from them like a spring. Our first hymn is hymn number 622, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Till I 
Please join me for our invocation. Holy, Holy One, we, we are, are thankful for who you are and all that you are. Your presence is desired here. We take joy in knowing that you are as close to us as our next breath. We thirst for you. May we be filled to overflowing with your love. Amen. We come to God as thirsty and hungry people that are longing to have our souls nurtured by God's merciful love. Let us make our confessions to God and draw from the well of God's abundant grace. Please join me for our prayer of confession. Enduring presence, we confess that sometimes we question if you are really among us or not. Sometimes we quarrel with you when we are tested. These are the moments when our outlook needs transformation. You are gracious in looking beyond our faults to see our needs and to meet them. Thank you for your immeasurable grace. Amen. New mercies are granted daily and every day. We have an opportunity to be changed forever and for good. Amen. We come to our time of pastoral prayer. We invite you to bring all of your prayer concerns, needs, joys as we pray together, as we turn to God. And uh, we invite you to utilize the link that is right below the video. And uh, we would be happy to share any prayer concerns that uh, you have uh, on Sunday morning and in our weekly email update. You can click on that link and fill out the form there and, and uh, submit any prayer concerns that you have, and we'll be happy to share those. As we pray together, we want to pray for all of the communities that are affected, uh, have been affected recently by the, uh, the train derailments and, and uh, those accidents. We pray for the folks in those communities as uh, efforts are underway to uh, 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 clean up and repair the damage that has been, uh, been uh, uh, a reality for those, uh, those communities. And we continue to pray for peace in our world, and we pray that God will bless us now as we turn to God in a spirit of prayer. Please pray with me. We thank you, O faithful God, for your steadfast love. In the times when we fall down and praise you and when we're so caught up in our present difficulties that we forget all that you have provided for us. We thank you, all-embracing God, for your example of inclusion and breaking down of barriers for the assurance that we are part of your beloved creation and that we are all welcomed into your family. O oh, gracious God, thank you for the hope that comes from endurance and the knowledge that we are reconciled to you who loves each one of us beyond our imagining. As we worship together, may we know your presence with us, inspiring us to worship in spirit and in truth. Oh God, there is much going on in all of our lives and our communities, and we bring to you the situations that are closest to our hearts. There is much in the world that we do not see or hear about, situations that we can feel disconnected from. But oh God, you know all of your children. You so love the world that you sent your only son, where there are boundaries and barriers that exclude, meaning that some are left without dignity, where basic human rights are stripped away and access to even the most basic need of needs is denied, where there is difference and division that cause fear when the beauty of diversity is disfigured by mistrust and partisanship and your children are excluded or made to feel worthless. We pray, O oh God, for healing, a healing of those divisions, and we ask that you would use us to help bring about healing in our world and among your people. 
And now, eternal God, we lift all of our unspoken concerns to you, knowing and, and trusting that you will speak to each of them and that you will receive them as we offer them to you in, with our faith and with our hope and with our love. Hear our silent prayers, O God. We offer all of these prayers spoken and unspoken to you, O God, and in the name of Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Our second scripture reading is our epistle reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. The apostle writes, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, 
having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, do you know what did the raindrop feel when it hit the window? The pain. And what is drinking water's favorite form of dance? Tap. And just so you know, the police arrested a bottle of water. It was wanted in three different states, liquid, solid, and gas. Those jokes were submitted on a Clemson University website by students, a number of them engineering students. Leonard Sweet writes this about water. He, he writes, is there anything else as miraculous as water? Search the cosmos for uh, other signs of life. So far, planet Earth is the only blue planet. It is the vast oceans of our world that have made it possible for all the life forms we know to develop on our planet. The first creation story in Genesis begins with its feet wet. Before any other creating can occur, God must gather the waters and separate a heavenly dome. Out of them, we cannot perceive even the primordial beginnings of life without water. Water is the fluid of life. And the word water, uh, Leonard Sweet says, comes from Arab, the Arabic uh, language for luster and splendor. It is often used in talking about jewelry, especially the luster and transparency of the finest jewels. Water is nature's jewelry, he says, the very elixir of life. What a beautiful way to think about water and the importance of water. As the, uh, the, the, as the Israelites wandered, they were continually faced with the question of what next? They were learning to trust day by day. They were learning the sentiment behind that portion of Jesus' model prayer, which we call the Lord's Prayer, which Jesus would offer centuries later, give us this day our daily bread. They had to learn day by day what it means to trust God in the wilderness. In the passage immediately prior to this one about the water coming from the rock at Horeb, in this, the passage immediately prior to it, we read where God provided bread for the people, manna in the wilderness every morning, uh, and God provided quail in the evenings, and the people ate, and they were nourished, and they were sustained, and they were learning that they could trust God. They were learning that God would provide for them day by day, their daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. However, it seemed that as for all of us, it is easy to forget lessons learned and to go back to doing things the way they were done before. And in this case, the people in the wilderness went back to complaining about lack of provisions. This time, they were complaining about a lack of water. As the people camped at Rephidim, they determined that there was no water, and they began to complain and to grumble and to quarrel with Moses over the lack of water. Give us water to drink, they demanded of Moses. Why did you bring us out here to die? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? And once again, memories are short, and at that moment they were convinced that slavery in Egypt was better than freedom in the desert. Now, in fairness to the people, to the nation, being in the desert without water is a frightening thing. It's an uncertain thing. We all know, and they knew, that people cannot survive long without water, especially when you're wandering in a hot, in a hot desert. But when we are faced with insecurity in life, we need to be careful with how we respond and to how we react. When things are in question, when things are not sure, of our, when we are not sure of our security, we tend to look for someone to blame, don't we? Too often the blame for our insecurity is placed on groups of people, people in a minority that we find it easy to scapegoat. Or we blame those in leadership 
as the people were doing with Moses, expecting them to have all of the answers and to be able to give us all of the assurances that we feel that we need. Or we blame shadowy figures and peoples, convinced that we are victims of conspiracies. Or we blame the people around us. We blame our loved ones and we take out our fears and our insecurities on them. We blame our neighbors or co-workers or other drivers on the road. Moses seemed perplexed. He was being blamed for something that he knew that he could not control. And he cried out to God, asking for guidance. So Moses cried out to the Lord, we are told in this passage, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. Now we can be sympathetic with the people's fears, can't we? But we may also acknowledge today that Moses did the right thing. He turned to God for help. If there was hope for the people, it would be found in God. It wouldn't be found in pointing fingers or playing the blame game. There was no conspiracy at work, just people seeking freedom from slavery, wandering in the wilderness, trying to find their way, and being taught by God along the way to trust God and to believe that God will provide for them one way or another. Moses may or may not have thought through all of this and the pressure of that moment. Moses was just perplexed. He was exasperated. He was frustrated because he was being blamed for this perceived disaster. But even in his exasperation, he did the right thing. He turned to God and asked for help. He turned to God and asked for guidance and wisdom and understanding and direction. And God answered Moses. God instructed Moses to go ahead of the people. Take some of the elders with you. God told Moses to take your staff with you and go out to the rock at Horeb and strike the rock and water will come out of it and the people will have plenty to drink. Groundwater. That's what came out of the rock. I read an estimate that indicates that about 30% of the readily available fresh water in the world is groundwater. And also, over 2 billion people worldwide rely on groundwater as their primary water source. It is likely that the Israelites searched for surface sources of water and they found none. It's also very likely that they tried to find water by digging their own wells and then they became frustrated and frightened because they were not finding any water, no matter what they did. But God spoke to Moses and revealed to Moses that there was water available. There was water that would sustain the people. They just didn't know where to look for it. So God directed Moses on where to look with the promise, I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. And Moses and the elders, with God's help, brought forth water from the rock. And once again, God provided for God's people. Paul uh, tells the Romans that while they were weak, while they were sinners, Christ died for us and revealed to us our reconciliation with God. While the Israelites were wandering in the desert, thirsty and afraid, God showed them the way to a source of water and provided for their needs, even when they seemed to be in their, at their most desperate and at their weakest state. Maybe we are lashing out at one another in the world. Maybe we are feeling afraid and anxious. Maybe we are angry and disgruntled because we are thirsty. Maybe at the root of it all, like the Israelites, we are thirsty people longing for God, longing for community and with one another, longing for a connection to God and people in the world, and we just do not know how to make it all happen. So we lash out at one another and we speak angry words at one another and we show our frustration to one another. Like the people wandering in the desert, maybe we are looking for the elixir of life, as Leonard Sweet describes water. Maybe we are looking for that spiritual elixir of life that will quench our dry and thirsty souls and make us feel alive. Maybe so many people are unhappy today because they are thirsty and they don't know where to find the water of, they, of life that they need and they're not finding it in material things, they're not finding it in entertainment, they're not finding it in social media. They're still thirsty, they're still thirsty and they don't know where to find the water of life that they need. 
The gospel reading for this Sunday is John chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. Uh, we didn't read that passage, but it is the story, and you know it well, the story of the woman at the well. It's the longest conversation that Jesus takes part in that is recorded in any of the gospels. How appropriate that that would be the longest, because in that story, we read about Jesus conversing with a woman about this very thing, the need for an eternal elixir of life. The woman comes to the local uh, well to draw water, and Jesus asks for a drink. The woman is surprised that Jesus is talking to her because he's Jewish and she's Samaritan, and the two groups were suspicious of each other and hated each other. And in the course of their conversation, Jesus reveals to the woman that he can offer her living water. Jesus told her, everyone who drinks this water from the physical well will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Maybe you and I are just thirsty. And we need to draw from the living water of Jesus, the source of living water that never, ever runs dry. Brett Blair shares this. He writes, uh, one of the commencement traditions at Harvard University is senior class chapel. On the morning of graduation, seniors gather in Memorial Church to hear the minister, the chaplain of the university, offer words of solace and encouragement as they leave the yard to take their places in the world. The 1998 senior class heard the unvarnished truth from the Reverend Dr. Peter Gomes, who was at that time the chaplain at Harvard University. Dr. Gomes has since passed away. Uh, he was the author of several books and an insightful preacher and spiritual leader. Dr. Gomes told the Harvard graduates this in 1998, you are going to be sent out of here for good and most of you aren't ready to go. The president is about to bid you into the fellowship of educated men and women and, and here he paused and spoke a few words slowly for emphasis, you know just how dumb you really are. And the senior class cheered in agreement. And worse than that, Dr. Gomes continued, the world and your parents in particular are going to expect that you will be among the brightest and best. But you know that you can no longer fool all the people even some of the time. By noontime today, you will be out of here. By tomorrow, you will be history. By Saturday, you will be toast. That's a fact, no exceptions, no extensions. Nevertheless, there is reason to hope, Dr. Gomes promised. The future is God's gift to you. God will not let you stumble or fall. God has not brought you this far to this place to abandon you or leave you here alone and afraid. The God of Israel never stumbles, never sleeps, never goes on sabbatical. This, my beloved and bewildered young friends, do not be afraid. Indeed, sisters and brothers in Christ, do not be afraid. If we are thirsty, God will provide the water that we need, the living water, the elixir of life, and we will have our thirsts quenched. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our faith as we say these words of affirmation by Stephen Best of the United Kingdom. The world is full of good things. As well as things which could be better. We are full of good things. As well as things which could be better. Today, whether we feel full of good things or full of things which could be better, God's open arms sweeps us up, up again, again in a, a mighty catch, catch, all of us. God's big love, costly, extravagant, and wasteful, cherishes us. God's lively spirit restores us and makes us fresh again. Our next hymn is hymn number 86, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
sun, moon, and stars spin their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. We come to our time of offering, and we are grateful to you for your ongoing support of St. Peter and St. Paul, United Church of Christ, both through your prayers, through your time and energy, and through your resources and your gifts to us. God gives us freely, so let us give freely to God. Let us bring gifts that sustain the life of the kingdom. May these resources be more than enough. Amen. Please join me for our prayer of dedication. Fount of blessing, receive our gifts and the joy that we give them. Be it time, tithe, or talent, it all comes from you. Thank you for blessing us so that we can be a blessing to you and to each other. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 537, My Hope is Built. Nothing less than joy. 
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on We thank you for joining us today. We hope that the service has been a blessing to you. We hope you have a great week ahead, and we look forward to worshiping with you again very soon. Please come back and join us again. Sisters and brothers, as you depart this space, remember that the God who caused water to flow from a rock is the same God who walks with you. Go forth with the assurance that in the midst of a chaotic world, something good can happen and something good will happen. Go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Oh, mm -hmm.